Venezuelans fleeing their homeland, being offered a chance to live and work in Trinidad and Tobago legally. Our top story in Caribbean Newsline for Thursday, April 11th, from the CMC News Center in Bridgetown, I'm Don Paris. Good evening. The Trinidad and Tobago government is giving a Venezuelans trying to escape the turmoil in their homeland a chance to live and work in the Twin Island Republic legally. National Security Minister Stuart Young on Thursday announced the creation of a registration system for Venezuelans. There will be a two-week registration period beginning May 31st and ending on June 14th, after which time law enforcement authorities will revert to the normal application of immigration laws. Minister Young told a post-cabinet media briefing that five registration centers, four in Trinidad and one in Tobago, will be opened for the registration process. Whether Venezuelans are here legally or illegally, once they come into the window of that two-week period and they register, they will derive the opportunity to get a registration card. They will have a work permit exemption permitting them to work for a year, but not an automatic year. At the end of six months, they must come into wherever we tell them their supervisory officers will be. They must come and provide us with further information as what has happened over that six-month period. And then they may be granted an extension for another six-month period. So they will be those Venezuelans, whether you're here illegal or illegally or legally, once you register in this two-week window, you will be permitted the opportunity to work for up to a year with a six-month increment that you'll come in and report. Stewart explained that the registration cards will have photo identification and security features. The minister said Venezuelans will also be able to access health care. Any person who is in Trinidad and Tobago can walk into an accident and emergency department at any health center, any public hospital, and they will receive health care. So that will continue for the Venezuelans who are registered. They will also be allowed to get primary health care and public health care. And the definitions are for emergency medical services, the initial treatment of acute medical conditions such as accidents, injuries, asthma, heart attacks, strokes, diabetic coma, infectious disease, and initial stabilization of fractures. So that's the emergency medical services. Under primary health care, this initial treatment and stabilization of cases that you walk in for, the med emergency medical services. And then public health is access to health promotional material and immunization as per the national immunization efforts. Anything over and beyond those identified medical services, primary health care and public health will have to be paid for. But Stewart said Cabinet had agreed that there would be no guarantees to a right of education, training or any other social services. Although he did say that if there are extra spaces in schools, then Venezuelans could be accommodated. But Venezuelans were not the only non-nationals that engaged Cabinet's attention on Thursday. The National Security Minister disclosed that Cabinet had mandated him to review the situation with respect to other illegal immigrants, including those held at the Immigration Detention Center, the IDC. What the population have said, in fact what some persons have said right here in post-Cabinet about our CARICOM brothers and sisters and other illegal immigrants, be it from Cuba, be it from Haiti, be them, be they from China, be, be them, be they from African countries. So when I visited the IDC, these are some of the other nationals, non-nationals of Trinidad and Tobago, and categories of persons who were detained at the immigration detention center. So I am going to review the policy with respect to all categories of illegal immigrants in Trinidad and Tobago including those who are detained at the IEDC and those who may not be detained. And I will come back to Cabinet with a policy and suggestions as how we should treat with them. It is foreseen that that process, if Cabinet is so minded, and I think they will be minded to consider a policy, will also have a cut-off date. The Bahamas Prime Minister, Dr. Hubert Minnis, says consultations will take place with stakeholders as his government moves to modernize immigration laws. Among the issues expected to be addressed are statelessness and the right of Bahamians to pass on their citizenship. 
Minister, the aim of the consultations will be to get input from citizens to arrive at comprehensive immigration legislation. In a, in a modern and transparent society, it's essential that the citizens have their input um, because at the end of it, you'll have less friction in passing such a legislation. We are listening to all of the individuals um, who have their, their say and their input. We will compile them all together and we would make the best decision in the best interest of the Bahamian citizens. And over in the Turks and Caicos Islands, the leader of the main opposition progressive national party, Washington Misik, has suggested that the Haitian consulate has played a role in the illegal immigration of Haitians into the British Overseas Territory. In a message to members of the legislature, Misik made reference to the recent tragedy in which 15 Haitians died when a boat carrying migrants from the French-speaking Caribbean nation sank off the Turks and Caicos Islands. He said he believed the consulate was not doing enough to stem the illegal entry of Haitians. Misik also voiced concern about the role of the Haitian consulate, asking if it's to help find a solution to the illegal entry or whether it's part of the problem. He added that despite firm statements by the government, boats from Haiti have not stopped coming and continue to arrive in the country at disturbing frequency. According to Misik, the cost of repatriation of Haitians has risen to more than four million U.S. dollars in the last three years, a heavy burden for a small public treasury. The Constitutional Court in Jamaica will Friday deliver its ruling in the matter in which the opposition People's National Party, PNP, is challenging sections of the National Identification and Registration NIDS Act, which it says breaches the rights of citizens. The PNP, through its General Secretary, Julian Robinson, is seeking a declaration that sections of the legislation which was passed last year breach guaranteed constitutional rights of Jamaican citizens and legal permanent residents of the country, including the right to be granted a passport and not to be deprived or denied except by due process of law. The party said that while it supports the concept of a national identification system and the use of modern technology in the administration of critical government services, the NIDS Act is flawed. But the government says the law is critical for creating a national identification database of Jamaicans. The NIDS will replace several pieces of identification now used by Jamaicans and those not registered will be unable to access certain government services. The Barbados Parliament has passed a legislation giving the Director of Public Prosecutions, the DPP, power to look into the finances of people suspected of corruption. The move came as Attorney General Dale Marshall told the House that authorities had hit a brick wall in pursuing reported cases of corruption because of limitations within existing laws. Marshall, who was piloting the Proceeds of Crime Amendment Order, also said he expected to bring a new Prevention of Corruption Act to Parliament within the next three months. He said a new anti-corruption agency is also coming. Marshall said the last administration sought Parliament's approval for a new Prevention of Corruption Act in 2011 to replace legislation that had been on the books since 1929, but it never became law. Coming up in Caribbean Newsline, regional trade unions take a stand against telecommunications giant flow. The details of that story and more after the break.
trade unions across the Caribbean and Latin America are taking a stand against the operations of telecommunications giant Flow. They're expressing dissatisfaction at the way the company's employees are being treated. We get more in this TVJ News report. Telecoms company Flow announced a slew of new products, but representatives from the UNI Liberty Latin America Trade Union Alliance assembled in Jamaica to expose some of the company's employment practices. This is a meeting that we've had to call because of the behavior of the company throughout the region. And the behavior is not just in Jamaica, it's in Antigua, it's in Grenada, it's in St. Lucia. The company has gone totally rogue and totally on bias towards our industrial relations practice in the Caribbean. He says the company has been defiant. They have taken a stance that because they have money, they can do what they think they have to do to get what they want. A major problem is the company's outsourcing practices, which the unions say take good jobs out of the Caribbean. Their commonality is to remove the high-end jobs and place new employees in the low-end um, aspect of their company operations. So they have legacy, the legacy employees of cable and wireless have been phased out, made redundant, while they're employing new employees on lower conditions. So you have two persons working in the same department, doing the same job. One is legacy cable and wireless, higher paid, better benefits, and one is, is now Liberty Global, lower paid, less benefits, doing the same job. The unions have pledged to carry a motion to the UNI ICTS World Conference in August, which will represent a global push, insisting that the company change its practices. The Jamaica Civil Aviation Authority, the JCAA, is responding to criticism, criticism of the probe into the November 2016 fatal plane crash in Greenwich Town, St. Andrew. It is rejecting claims by a flight school operator that the agency relied on false information in its investigation into the deadly crash. It's also maintaining that all its investigations were carried out according to international standards. We get more in this TVJ News report. aircraft and by its operator, the Caribbean Aviation Training Center. Shortcomings were also found on the part of the JCAA, which has oversight responsibility for the local airspace. Speaking at a press conference this morning, Director General of the JCAA, Nari Williams Singh, sought to address statements made by Captain Errol Stewart. One of the issues which was pointed out by Captain Stewart is that the JCAA was conflicted since they were carrying out an investigation against itself. However, Mr. William Singh says that was not so. The NTSB of the United States. The NTSB is an accredited party to the investigation as the aircraft involved in the accident was manufactured and registered in the United States. The aircraft engine manufacturer, like Homing, and the aircraft manufacturer, Cessna, were technical advisors to the NTSB. It is therefore disingenuous to suggest that the JCAA was investigating itself, given the participation of the aforementioned third parties. The JCAA Director General also sought to clarify the issue surrounding the ring gear, which was pictured in the plane crash report. The photo appearing in the official report is that of the engine manufacturers, like Homing's, reference starter ring gear, not the actual part taken from the aircraft. The engine manufacturer attached the reference starter ring gear to the engine crankshaft during the investigations to determine measurements and specifications. From those measurements, it was determined by the engine manufacturer that the engine's internal timing was incorrect. Guyana's police commissioner Leslie James has urged officers to stop accepting bribes from members of the public. At the same time, he threatened those who offer the bribes that they too could be penalized. James made it clear that the force will be targeting members of the public who try to bribe, bribe lawmen since the offense is a two-way street involving both givers and takers. We get more in this HGP News report. For the past several years and even now, the acceptance of bribes and incentives have landed junior and senior police ranks before the courts. Some have also been prosecuted for this act. 
But it seems despite actions being taken against officers who accept bribes, the problem still exists, tarnishing the image of the force which is currently trying to reform itself under new management. During his remarks at a recent event, Commissioner of Police Leslie James expressed utter disdain at the fact that officers are still indulging in this callous practice. And let me warn you, the civilians, we'll be coming after you, those of you who are offering. You can't be offering to police and then say the police take a bribe. It is simple. Do not commit offenses. If you do not have a tin for bit, you just cannot carry a tint on your vehicle. The police commissioner further added that without an offer, there can't be an acceptance. He further noted that for years, those accusing officers of bribery are often offering incentives and have not faced the law for their actions. So the police what stops you, force you onto an offense, and you decide to make that offer, and the corrupt police decide to take, both of you are culpable. The offer and the person who accepted. I'm going to engage particular departments in the force was to pursue particular exercise to deal with this coach. The top cop spoke specifically to traffic ranks, who he said are the ones who are most times accused of bribery. He affirmed that persons who offer bribes will not be encouraged to tarnish the force. It is not a one-way exercise. Offer and acceptance. And you, the police ranks, if you're not comfortable with your salaries, leave the job. And ahead in Newsline Sport, West Indies Cricket gets a new head coach and chairman of selectors. Stay with us. the soul because this is one Caribbean you know Caribbean unity musically and as much as I've been doing music for a lot of years you know I mean real years I don't even want to talk about years I was about to say how long have you been in the business yeah this year makes 31 years I started wow. very young I'm down here filming with Johnny Damon, I get it, but I'm in Florida, I can kill some time by going in just small pond hoppers. Now, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to be here, so make sure you get permission. I'm from Boston, I just, I just kind of fly by the seat of my pants. I mean, I don't know how long I'll be before I get thrown out of here, so I want to try to get a couple before I get bounced. Anywhere I see water, I always wonder, are there bass in there? So to me, making a few casts to put my curiosity at rest is a good thing. Otherwise, I may just go crazy. Little guy. All right, little guy on Frankie. Yeah, that's small pond fishing, baby. Time for sports. Former West Indies and Jamaica cricketer Robert Haynes has been appointed the interim chairman of selectors of West Indies cricket, replacing Barbadian Courtney Brown. President of Cricket West Indies Ricky Scarrett made the announcement at a news conference in Antigua on Thursday morning. Scarrett described the change as a calculated strategic move designed to reignite the passion for West Indian cricket culture. We are confident that in Mr. Haynes, we have found an interim chairman who shares the philosophy of inclusiveness and therefore believes in our new selection policy. Because of his impressive track record of good relations with players and past players, we have no doubt that Mr. Haynes will engage with players everywhere, strictly in the interest of what is best for West Indian cricket. Haynes, who was at the press conference, says he will work to create a level playing field for cricketers across all levels of, fi of fitness. First of all, you have to look at the philosophy in terms of selection 
criteria that are required in terms of the new policy. And as the chairman of selectors, it is important that at all time I am fair and impartial in what I'm doing in terms of moving West Indies cricket forward. Um, it will be a case where, as the chairman, I will sit down with Jimmy and other stakeholders in terms of the direction that we need to go. So when I sit with my board, or my panel, as we say, we could definitely look at the direction that we need to go in and make sure that we try at all time to select the best possible team to represent the West Indies. And it's also important that the coach and the captain, when we sit down to discuss cricket, that they have this freedom of expressing themselves, what is it they need in terms of players to represent the team. So we could sit down as a group, discuss this, and we could move forward. Meanwhile, former West Indies captain Floyd Reefer has been appointed interim head coach of the men's senior team. He will serve in the post until the end of the 2019 ICC Cricket World Cup in England and Wales. Reefer replaces Richard Pybus, who has been the team's interim coach since January. Scarrett said Reefer's appointment is part of CWI's new West Indian First policy, which utilizes regional experience. Our West Indian First policy is no disrespect to foreign coaches. On Tuesday, our board set a new standard of not less than four out of every five members of the coaching and support staff should be of West Indian origin. This enables us to continue to have international participants working for CWI in areas where there is no one of equal quality available regionally. But wherever there are foreign coaches in our system, we will be undertaking a clear succession plan for a local replacement. Developing and exposing regional expertise in coaching is a high priority for the future of our cricket. Our landmark decision to immediately introduce a well-suited young West Indian professional as our men's team coach is therefore a clear indicator of the seriousness of our West Indian First policy and represents our commitment to celebrate the best of what it means to be West Indian. Director of Cricket Jimmy Adams, meantime, welcomed the announced changes, saying Cricket West Indies needs to develop talent at all levels. I've always maintained that um, with the resources that we have, we can't afford to exclude uh, any sort of um, expertise that we have in the region, whether it be playing expertise or coaching expertise. Uh, my record in the region will, will speak to how passionate I am about developing our regional coaches as well as our players. And to this end, I think uh, what we have started here is a fantastic opportunity because it gives hope, it gives motivation, and it should inspire not just the regional players, but also the coaches in the region that we have a pathway that will take them all the way to the top and that there won't be any hindrances along the way. Grenada's cricketers are the new champions of the Windward Islands tournament. The Spice Islanders finished on top of the standings with 21 points, three more than St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Dominica was third on 12 and St. Lucia brought up the rear on six points. A stroke-filled 100 from Kiron Kotoy had propelled SVG to first innings points over the Grenadians in their final round match of the two-day competition. Kotoy slammed 11 fours and 8 sixes in his 105 from 58 balls. It took him just over one and a half hours at the crease as SVG were bowled out for 364 in reply to Grenada's first innings total of 334. Romano Pierre supported with 67, Dylan Douglas made 56, Atticus Brown added 46, and Winward's Windward's Volcanoes player Obed McCoy got 32 to lead the strong reply for SVG. Brown and Pierre shared 90 for the second wicket before Pierre and Douglas added 59 and Kotoy dominated a stand of 96 with McCoy for the ninth wicket and was the last man out. In the other match, Alec Anthony staged an impressive all-round performance but Dominica had to settle for first innings points in a draw with St. Lucia. Anthony is a former West Indies under-19 star, followed up a spell of 5 for 69 from 21 overs with a solid 102 off 135 balls that included 12 fours and 3 sixes as Dominica declared on 287 for 8 in reply to St. Lucia's first innings total of 203. Kershaki Joe Lewis cracked 53 for the Dominicans. Kelvin James made 
41, and Taj Tavernier added 35 to play key roles in a solid reply. Dominica were wobbling on 49 for 3, but Anthony's was the glue in the successive stands of 94 with Lewis, 55 with Tavernier, and 65 with James. Dornan Edward bagged 3 for 28 from 4.5 overs to be the leading St. Lucian bowler, and Volcano's left arm spinner Larry Edward bagged 2 scalps. Jamal James led the way with 68 for St. Lucia after they elected to bat. The two Edwards, Larry and Dornan, made 41 and 23 respectively. James and Larry Edwards shared 59 for the seventh wicket, but there was no stability from the rest of the St. Lucian batting as Anthony's undermined their batting with his off spin. And that's the sport. We'll be right back. Well, apparently, $30 million doesn't buy what it used to, especially if your wish list includes taking down a sitting president of the United States. Approximately $30 million was spent on the Mueller investigation of candidate Donald Trump and whether Trump colluded with Russia to fix the U.S. election in 2016. $30 million and we get no evidence of collusion. So the same people who were saying in 2018 that Trump would have to accept the Mueller conclusion Is there anything that you would like to see going forward, Dr. Claus? Yes, I, I would love for, uh, for us at, at the Ministry of Health uh, and in terms of our national health system to sustain our response mm -hmm. and maintain our elimination status. Not get caught up in the euphoria and forget about it. No, I think this is, this is very important for us. Again, the major developments of this day, Venezuelans fleeing their homeland, being get, given a chance to live and work in Trinidad and Tobago legally under a new registration system. And in sport, Floyd Reefer replaces Richard Pibus as West Indies interim head coach, and Robert Haynes is the new interim chairman of selectors, replacing Barbadian Courtney Brown. And that's Caribbean News Line for news and sport round the clock. Subscribe to CanonNews.com, and for more of our programming, log on to caribvision.tv and check out our YouTube channel. We'll be back here again tomorrow, but from all of us at CMC News, thank you for watching and have yourselves a good night.